Bina, I will talk about, as you said, operational flood forecasting and early warning at European and global scale, starting from the example of the European Flood Awareness System and then the research that has been developed around it. So I'm Lorenzo Alfieri from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, and thank you for the for attending it. So, uh, as hydrologists, we historically always been fond on uh, of uh, looking at what happens in uh, in river networks at, river, at several river stages by um, collecting measurements about our rivers. And also, uh, we always wanted to know what comes next, what comes from the latest observations, so the future values. So why is this useful? Well, there's a, there are a number of reasons, actually. So uh, for water supply, they're useful for hydropower production, for floods and drought mitigation, and consequently for early warning. And then other um, activities like uh, uh, river navigation, leisure activities, insurance and reinsurance sector, climate change studies, and so on. So is it really difficult to do ideological forecasting? Well, no, it's, it's, it's quite easy. The problem is doing uh, good ideological forecasting. So we can start from simple example, like taking a constant values. Uh, it's very trivial. It's used in many um, verification scores as benchmark. It will be quite OK for the first uh, time step, but then uh, then, of course, it cannot be a reasonable approximation. So we can use climatological values and trends. So uh, if we have a historical records of the station, we can look at what happened in the previous years and try to extrapolate this trend. So going for more sophisticated uh, approaches, we can use regression from, for um, with upstream stations. And that works quite well if we are uh, a bit downstream, but of course the forecast lead time will only be uh, proportion to the travel time of the um, of the flow between the two points. So then, uh, if we want to extend further the forecast lead time, we have to mostly use ideological modeling, which can be based on observed meteorological input or forecast input. If we want to extend the lead time even further, so starting with two very simple examples uh, of forecasting, here we can see, for example, in the top image, a river in Brazil where uh, we have the, uh, this observed discharge in red dashed line, and we can see that a seasonal approach looking at the past years works quite well. Actually, the, uh, the second example, a river in Australia, is even more provocative because you can actually see that if you take a forecast, uh, the previous um, the, pre the values of the previous day of the two days before, you can actually get a very good forecast with uh, a very good uh, uh, skill on average. The problem, of course, is that you you don't get any good um, signal for upcoming extreme events. So the challenges in hydrological forecasting are mainly forecasting changes in our discharge and our river level, and also forecasting extremes. And also uh, another problem is that the behavior of our river discharge is normally like this one in the figure, so it's very difficult to predict. So uh, in the last decades, uh, there has been an increasing trend of floods and of um, especially in terms of population affected and in the economic losses. So up to now, this uh, trend, this increasing trend, has been associated mostly with social economic changes. So mainly increased uh, uh, population, uh, increased um, urban areas, urbanized areas, and so on. But of course, it's most likely that in the future, the climate change will, um, will get things worse and increase the, the damage even further. So it turns out that there is an increased need for early warning system. This need has, uh, has been felt by, at the European level, by the European Commission, especially after a severe flood that occurred in the Central Europe in 2002, in the Elbe and in Germany, and uh, in the central part of Europe. So after that, the European Commission in 2003 launched the development of a European flood awareness system. At that time, it was called alert system. And that involved a number of stages, like building up part of a, um, a partner network, adapting existing methodologies for operational flood forecasting and early warning, and so on. So the system uh, grew 
in uh, with time uh, so it started to become preparational and then uh, it acquired a web interface for displaying results until the recent years where it started it started to be adopted as um as an aid tool for flood forecasting by uh, the European Civil Protection and uh, later on by the Copernicus Emergency Response Service. Until 2012, when uh, IFAS became operational um, and it, it was transferred to a um, European organization, and since then, uh, ECMWF is responsible for the computational phase of EFAS, meaning running the forecast and pushing the results on the website, and also running some uh, verification. So, uh, in a nutshell, EFAS uh, comprises hydrometeorological simulation of ensemble weather prediction um, to produce ensemble stream flow prediction with a distributed hydrological model. So as we can see in the figure on top, we have our multimodal ensemble forecast. We compare them uh, for, um, for let's say 10 days until now. Uh, we compare them with warning thresholds, which are derived from a consistent climatology. And when we see that there is a substantial probability of exceeding uh, these warning thresholds in the coming days, results are automatically displayed on our website to hotspots, so to these reporting points that we can see, especially the, um, the forecasters on duty and the IFA dissemination center, they can check and then send alert emails to um, our partners of the IFA network. So, uh, among the key points of IFAS, uh, we have the ideological modeling. So, we use the least flood ideological model, which is a physically based distributed model with a routed component. It is set up for you on a five kilometer grid res resolution, and it is subject to periodic uh, um, parameter calibration, especially as new data becomes available. So uh, just a few months ago, it has been uh, um, the new calibration, the latest calibration round has been um, has been performed. In this case, uh, almost 700 stations were calibrated using um, interpolated meteorological fields as input, and uh, about uh, on average seven years and a half of daily stream flow data uh, for calibration. Another key point of our um, of our system is, of course, uh, the input data, the weather forecast. So the idea is that the multimodal input improves the evaluation of the uncertainty. So uh, for this, in IFAS, we use uh, two deterministic forecasts and two ensemble forecasts. So we use uh, the ECMWF high resolution forecast over 10 days and the DWD, the German Weather Service uh, forecast over seven days at bit final resolution. And then we have the ensemble forecast of ECMWF, 51 member over 10 day, and Cosmolabs forecast, um, high resolution, seven kilometer, it's uh, 16 member over five days and a half. So uh, all these models are run uh, twice daily at uh, 0 and 12 UTC. So in total, IFAS ran uh, 138 ensemble uh, weather predictions daily. Um, besides meteorological forecast, we have also a good network of meteorological input data, which comes from uh, uh, station observation. And um, as you can see from the example below, we have now more or less uh, more than 600 stations for observed precipitation and uh, more than 4,000 stations for um, observed temperature and other parameters. So uh, this data set is very important because it's then spatially interpolated to, to obtain continuous fields of uh, daily meteorological data. And these are used uh, uh, to update our ideological model to uh, estimate every day uh, the best set of initial condition where to start our model. In fact, these uh, meteorological observations are available for quite many years, basically from 1990. So now we have uh, about 23 years of, uh, um, of these observations, which in IFAS have been used uh, after spatial interpolation to run our same ideological model and uh, construct basically our uh, long-term discharge climatology, so long-term simulation of uh, discharge and of the ideological conditions in the river network over the, over the whole of Europe. 
so basically um, in addition to uh, providing the initial condition this data set is used uh, to estimate our other, other thresholds. So by applying extreme volume distribution fitting on the annual maxima, we can estimate um, analytical um, return periods of this church corresponding to a number of return periods. And typically what we use for IFAS are the two, five, and 20 years return period, depending on the severity. Uh, we have an example, first example of FIFAS forecast. So what basically we can see from our website, uh, www.ifas.eu. So uh, this is the case for the UK floods of December 2020, uh, 2012. This is an example for the Trent River where uh, when uh, on the 18th of December, we saw quite a substantial probability of, ex of exceeding the five year return period threshold over the, the following day. So that's what basically our forecasters on duty can see. Uh, on the bottom right figure, you can also see the persistence table, which is what is being used and is actually used to prepare uh, IFAS alerts. Because um, what is important is also to, um, to check the consistency and the, the persistence of uh, the flood uh, um, signal over consecutive forecasts. In this case, an alert was sent, and in, uh, it was the flood was actually confirmed towards uh, the last decade, the, uh, the last ten days of um, of uh, December. Uh, beside the ensemble stream flow prediction, there are a number of uh, um, additional products that the forecaster on duty can see. So, for example, we have upstream precipitation, snow melt, average temperature, cosmolabs ensemble stream flow prediction, the persistent diagram, and also an overview of the threshold exceedance uh, to check the consistency of different models uh, for the same forecast and for the same days. Another example is the floods in Central Europe that occurred in June 2013, so just last year. This is an example for the um, Elbert Wittenberg, where with IFAS we had a very good signal about eight, nine days before the flood peak. And this was both quantitatively and, um, and also in terms of timing was quite precise. We analyzed a bit closely this case study because the situation was very bad also in the, in the Danube River Basin especially in the upper part. And you can find more details in a publication of Pappenberger et al. in our ECMWF newsletter. So uh, a similar system like IFAS uh, needs a good evaluation framework because of course this is at the base of uh, the monitoring and, uh, and the improving of the system. So recently we have set up an automated, a semi-automated updating procedure which runs every month uh, to evaluate performance score over uh, 10 days of forecast for windows, so sliding windows of uh, the preceding 12 months. So uh, the scores are run uh, for every uh, lead time uh, f for um, about 38,000 grid points and are displayed for uh, as maps or uh, towards lead time, upstream era and time. So as I, as I said, um, uh, IFAS became operational at ECMWF since, uh, since October 2012. So uh, this operational data set was complemented with four years of hindcast uh, run with a frozen uh, model parameterization. So to obtain uh, uh, now more than five years of forecast to which um, run the, the IFAS skill score. So this is just example of our skill score for a lead time for five days. Now I will not focus very much on the on the details of the score. I just want to mention that uh, among the score that we run, we have continuous run probability skill score, which is um, dedicated to ensemble forecast. And then we have uh, coefficient of variation of the root mean squared error, the percentage bias, and the Nash subscript. So, of course, as you can see, they're all dimensionless score, which um, helps to compare. Uh, results over different points in the river network with different regimes and um, an upstream area. So you can also see that um, example of results uh, against the forecast lead time, then against the catchment size for each grid point, and then we have performance against um, the, um, the past years. So uh, 
Let's move on now with the complementary uh, tool that we use in the framework of IFAS. And this was developed a few years ago, and it's devoted to, uh, to assist the flash flood forecasting. So uh, a few years ago, with co some colleagues of the GRC, I started developing um, an index, which we named the European Precipitation Index based on simulated climatology. And with this index, we try to um, detect upcoming flash floods by uh, linking them to extreme precipitation accumulation at the catchment scale. So uh, basically, uh, this index APIC compares accumulated upstream precipitation for uh, durations typical of flash flood events, so up to 24 hours, and it compares it with reference thresholds which are derived from a consistent reforecast data set. So there is no ideological simulation in this method, which makes it uh, quite um, light to run because it's basically um, a statistical uh, comparison of forecast against uh, some thresholds. And that's why it can run on a final resolution in transit one kilometer scale over most of the European domain. So we can see some example of uh, the results of this index in flash flood forecasting. This is a screenshot from the IFAS website um, looking at IFAS ideological forecast for central Italy end of February uh, 2011, where, which shows that no strong signal was um, was shown by the IFAS forecast, which is which are actually targeted to uh, quite large river basins. The same forecast uh, from the APIC index shows actually a very strong signal for extreme precipitation in about one day and a half, two days. And actually, that was confirmed uh, by extreme uh, stream flow in most of um, the rivers in the coastal catchments, uh, which burst their banks and uh, provoke flooding. So as you can see from the top, uh, from the bottom right graph, uh, this index is basically dimensionless. So that's why we transform it into return periods and actually into probabilistic return periods since it comes from an ensemble forecast so that we can easily see uh, when there is a high probability of exceeding uh, uh, severe warning thresholds. And then we have other example where this, uh, we showed that um, uh, this system works quite well in uh, predicting flash flood. Of course, uh, the typical forecast lead time in this case is a bit short, is around uh, one, two days, because of course these events are, have little predictability, have shorter predictability. So uh, a study that was carried out uh, in 2012 showed that over two years of, uh, of forecast, we predicted more than 40 flash floods with average forecast lead time of about 32 hours and with um, uh, in catchments with the upstream area quite, short, uh, quite small compared to those targeted by IFAS forecast, so mostly le less than 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, now, an interesting development of this approach was to, um, that we have um, uh, carried out recently was to basically apply the same methodology to, um, to predict floods by using uh, surface runoff instead of, uh, instead of accumulated precipitation. And this allows us to um, predict floods not just driven by extreme precipitation, but also from different other ideological processes like uh, snow melt uh, or soil saturation and so on. But uh, the basic is the same as the APIC, so it's uh, extreme frequency analysis on the, um, on the forecast, on the ensemble forecast against uh, our forecast climatology. So uh, in this case, the surface runoff was taken from the land surface scheme of uh, ECNWF uh, um, forecasting system, and it's compared with the threshold derived from the 20 year forecast data set. Another uh, difference with EPIC is that in this case, we target a wider range of forecast uh, of uh, basin size by making the, the duration of the accumulation proportional to the basin size through the time of concentration. So in this case, we target not just flash flood, but also uh, larger river basins. So we have run this index for over about uh, two years and eight months. And we have seen quite positive results. And this is uh, an example for the, um, for the Central Europe flood of June 2013. So this is an example on the top right 
of the um, ensemble prediction of the extreme runoff index. Um, it's a probabilistic prediction, in this case for a station in Linz, uh, in the Danube, in Austria. And we can see uh, on the top left that um, um, the, uh, a map of the probability of exceeding the five-year return period. And um, we compare this with uh, the, same for, uh, the same forecast for, from IFAS, and we can see that um, compared to the, what was uh, our proxy route derived by the IFAS uh, water balance, the background simulation driven by uh, meteorological observation, we can see that the, in this case, the forecast with the extreme runoff index were even, uh, let's say, the, they look uh, especially better than those of the of a real of a hydrometeorological simulation. In this case, um, we think that the use of uh, reforecast data set plays a, um, an important role in making this approach more uh, consistent, let's say. So I just want to close the chapter on the IFAS part by just advertising a bit our IFAS by monthly bulletin, which is uh, produced every two months at ECMWF and it's uh, fully available at this link where you can find uh, updates on IFAS news, uh, the overall meteorological and ideological uh, situation of the past two months, uh, summary of flood alerts and skill score and case study and so on. So please go and have a look. Now let's uh, uh, move, let's digress a bit from flood early warning and let's talk a, um, again a bit more about the um, IFAS, um, the water balance that is run um, at, uh, in, the, in the context of IFAS. So basically, um, at some point, we decided to use our uh, long-term ideological simulation over the whole of Europe to uh, produce new flood uh, hazard map for Europe. Because in fact, uh, that's quite a consistent uh, database all over Europe. So uh, similarly to the approach to uh, the reef, our flood warning threshold, we applied the flood frequency analysis on, um, on the whole of Europe to the reef annual maximum discharge corresponding to 100 year return period over different durations. So one, two, three days and so on. So from these maps, we could uh, build up design flood hydrographs corresponding to the same return period and then run them uh, through a 100 meter resolution DM over the whole Euro, but of course running several simulation of a, a limited scale, limited domain. So by running more than 37,000 simulation and merging the output, uh, we managed to obtain a European flood hazard map. So uh, the output map at 100 meter resolution on the domain that you can see now in, uh, in dark gray is pretty huge. So of course you have to um, zoom in to appreciate the details in terms of uh, flood extent and flood uh, maximum flood depth corresponding to 100 year return period. So we can zoom in, for example, in the Danube area and then again in the, in the region of Hungary and then again on Budapest and you can see uh, you can see the details of the flood hazard map. So what we have done is also a comparison with the region of this flood hazard map with regional maps where um, some uh, regional maps were provided by um, by local authorities. So uh, we have we can see here the example of the comparison for the Severn and the Thames River Basin for the United Kingdom and also for the Saxony region for Germany. We can see that um, uh, the scores between um, our uh, flood hazard map and the regional map uh, is quite um, is quite skillful, especially in terms of uh, probability of detection and of critical success index. So let's move forward to the last chapter of the of this talk and uh, talk a bit about uh, the development of a global flood awareness system, so or GLOFAS, and uh, as the name suggests. Uh, uh, we basically took the same methodologies employed in IFAS to uh, set up um, ensemble flood forecasting and early warning system at a global scale. 
So uh, let's have a look at the system overview. It is very similar to uh, what we use in EFAS. We have a set of uh, uh, spatial information at the global scale, of course, and then we have uh, weather prediction and observation. So uh, particularly we use uh, uh, ECNWF and Sambo forecast. Uh, we have ideological model, we are, which is a bit uh, different from what we use in EFA. So uh, in details, we use the output of the land surface scheme, which is coupled to the um, ECMWF uh, forecasting system, uh, so that we produce surface runoff that is then uh, routed by a modified version of leaf flood, which um, includes the routing and the ground water. So this is all set up at 0 0.1 degree resolution and runs globally with one day temporal resolution. So again, as in interest, when um, uh, the ensemble of simple prediction uh, are, have a high probability of exceeding one of the um, warning thresholds, we have uh, an automatic procedure to, pr to produce dynamic uh, reporting points globally so that we can check the forecast and uh, produce what is a flood warning, even though the, the system is still not operational. Uh, the meteorological input data is uh, basically comes from ECNWF, so uh, we use ECNWF Ensemble Forecast 51 member. In this case, we use, we use 15 days of forecast, so um, uh, after 10, uh, day 10, we have an increase of resolution. Uh, even though the model is run for uh, 45 days to account of for the um, delayed, uh, for the delays given by the routing of the, the flood wave through the, through the river network. The most uh, different bit uh, in comparison to IFAS is uh, regard the long-term hydrological simulation, which is used to uh, deliver a flood warning threshold. In particular, since uh, of course there is um, there is currently no uh, global hydrological um, network of um, meteorological observations worldwide, we had to use a uh, global atmospheric reanalysis, and particularly we used era interim reanalysis which is available from 79 to, to present uh, with about uh, 80 kilometer resolution. So what we did is using this meteorological data set to run the same ideological model uh, set up globally and then uh, uh, extrapolate the warning threshold from this simulation. In addition, from the same simulation, what we've done is compare uh, results in terms of this judge with observations that were made available for a number of stations. So in particular, we collected 620 uh, river stations with at least five years of daily data, and we compared them with the simulations driven by ERA interim. So also in this case, it is um, a key part of the comparison is using dimensionless score, which enable the comparison at different locations with different upstream area and different ideological regimes. So, for example, you can see here that for each station, uh, we could compare observed and simulated discharge, and then we have a number of uh, sort of scorecard with uh, a number of skill score to check the performance of our model. So, um, the the next stage of the system is comparing whether the uh, ensemble forecast how do they perform in comparison to our proxy simulation, which is driven by our interim uh, meteorological data set. So uh, in the first part of this comparison, we use, uh, we, we assess the performance of uh, quantitative distance forecasting. So we ran two years of daily forecast, 2009 and 2010. And we assess the CRPSS uh, by considering a persistent forecast as a reference. So you can see all the, um, uh, the points, the grid points in blue, which have a positive uh, CRPSS comparison to a persistent fork. So this is the case for five days and 15 days lead time. Of course, this, the system is supposed to, uh, to be designed for early warning. So we want to see how it performs in terms of threshold exceedance analysis. Um, so we set the threshold of the 90th percentile of the discharge climatology for each point. 
and we want to assess what is the lead time of uh, our uh, of the skillful forecast that we can achieve with the GLOFAS. So as you can see with the different shadings of blue in the figure, we have a um, good skill for especially for large river basins which can reach up to 25 days and above, especially, for example, in the, um, in the Amazon River Basin in South America and Africa. And this is due thanks to the, um, the basically to the uh, advance uh, which is given by the uh, weather forecast and the delay given by the routing of the, um, of the water through the river network. Here we have some example of uh, 25 days ensemble forecast for different outlet, outlets of uh, big river basins worldwide, in, as you can see in different climatic conditions from the Amazon in tropical conditions, the Yenisei, for example, in northern Russia. Uh, so moving on to more practical um, cases, we have an example here for the Pakistan flood in August uh, 2010. It was, this was basically the worst flood affecting Pakistan in living memory. You can see on the right satellite imagery from MODIS, which compare a uh, normal dry condition with uh, the situation which was detected on the 11th of August in 2010. So uh, we can see that for this station in the top left, um, a very good, a very strong signal from GLOFAS was detected about uh, 15 days in advance, if we consider uh, the flood peak, with very high probability, forecast probability of exceeding the 5 and 20 year uh, return period. So that was quite a good forecast, uh, especially in terms of time. So uh, moving on to a more recent uh, flood event, we have the case of the big flood in Amur region. Uh, which is basically a river basin shared between northeastern China and uh, eastern Russia. So in August, September 2013, uh, this river basin, the lower part, especially suffered its worst uh, flood recorded. And we can see that in this case, Glopas forecast um, did quite a, quite a good job by uh, predicting uh, even one uh, one month in advance, 30 day, um, a distinct flood peak, uh, more or less at the end of August, beginning of September. So I want to point out that this is uh, what we saw on uh, Glofos website on the 1st of August. So it, it's not a reanalysis or a case study, it's really what our website was, uh, was showing. And then if we look at uh, the forecast of the 15th of August, you can see that the signal became much stronger by predicting a peak in the first 10 days of September, with the whole ensemble getting narrower and completely um, in the region above the 20 year return period for discharge. So, um, what happened in reality is actually, was actually reported by many news. Um, and by the media, we can see on the top, uh, again, some satellite imagery from MODIS, uh, comparing normal conditions on the left and uh, flooding condition on, at the end of August. We can see the location of the city of Khabarovsk in Russia, which was particularly affected. Um, and in fact, on the 4th of September, local meteorologists reported that uh, the water level in Khabarovsk were basically uh, about two meters above the historical record, which was re uh, registered uh, about 120 years ago. So that was really something um, unprecedented and something that is difficult to imagine. And I just want to conclude with the image of this man uh, windsurfing in the flooded stadium of Khabarovsk in uh, September 2013. And uh, this reminds me that the flood early warning is just one phase of the disaster response cycle, but that also includes the dealing with the flood situation, the post-flood recovery, and the subsequent improvement of preventing measures. So uh, events like this are out of 
our imagination. And even when a good early warning system is in place, people is not really able to cope with them. So uh, to conclude, I think that one of the key aspects is to increase our resilience towards extreme events and to develop our prevention strategies with the idea of being able of living with floods rather than just trying to fight them. So with this, I've concluded and I thank you very much.